You are listening to Catholic Family Podcast. Welcome fellow travelers through the liturgical year. This is Lisa Davis with another Feast Day Quick Take on the Feast of St. Agnes again. You might remember the church celebrating the Feast of St. Agnes a little over a week ago on the 21st of January, and you might have noticed that with this and that and all the other things, I didn't end up getting a Feast Day Quick Take out on that day. But no worries, as it turns out, I get to make good. St. Agnes has another feast day on the liturgical calendar called, and you're going to love this, it's called St. Agnes's Second Feast Day, and it's today, January 28th. You might ask, why on earth does this humble little saint have a second feast day so close to her chief feast day? And it's a fair question. I can't remember any other circumstance quite like this one in the liturgical year. But there really is an excellent and simple explanation. Best started, I think, by retelling the story of her holy martyrdom in the words of Father Alban Butler. Quote, St. Agnes was but twelve years old when she was led to the altar of Minerva at Rome and commanded to obey the persecuting laws of Diocletian by offering incense. In the midst of the idolatrous rites, she raised her hands to Christ her spouse and made the sign of the life-giving cross. She did not shrink when she was bound hand and foot, though the jives slipped from her young hands, and the heathens who stood around her were moved to tears. The bonds were not needed for her, however, and she hastened gladly to the place of her torture. Next, when the judge saw that pain had no terrors for her, he inflicted an insult worse than death. Her clothes were stripped off, and she had to stand in the street before a pagan crowd. Yet even this did not daunt her. Christ, she said, will guard his own. And so it was. Christ showed by a miracle the value which he sets upon the custody of the eyes. Whilst the crowd turned away their eyes from the spouse of Christ as she stood exposed to view in the street, there was one young man who dared to gaze at the innocent child with immodest eyes. A flash of light struck him blind, and his companions bore him away half dead with pain and terror. Lastly, her fidelity to Christ was proved by flattery and offers of marriage, but she answered, Christ is my spouse. He chose me first, and his I will be. At length the sentence of death was passed. For a moment she stood erect in prayer, and then bowed her neck to the sword. At one stroke her head was severed from her body, and the angels bore her pure soul to paradise. End quote. So, the first feast of St. Agnes, last week on the 21st, commemorates specifically the date of her martyrdom. Let's go to Abbot Garanger's liturgical year to explain the second feast. Quote, Five days after the martyrdom of the Virgin Emerantiana, Notabene, St. Emerantiana was the close friend of St. Agnes, often called her foster sister. To continue then, after this second martyrdom, quote, the parents of the glorious St. Agnes visited the tomb of their child during the night, there to weep and pray. It was the eighth day since her martyrdom. Whilst they were thinking upon the cruel death, which, though it had enriched their child with a martyr's palm, had deprived them of her society, Agnes suddenly appeared to them. She was encircled with a bright light, and wore a crown on her head, and was surrounded by a choir of virgins of dazzling beauty. On her right hand there stood a beautiful white lamb, the emblem of the divine spouse of Agnes. Turning toward her parents, she said to them, Weep not over my death, for I am now in heaven together with these virgins, living with him whom I loved on earth with all my soul. Abbot Garanger continues, It is to commemorate this glorious apparition that the Holy Church has instituted this feast, which is called Sancta Agnetis Secundo, or St. Agnes's Second Feast. Let us pray to this fervent spouse of the Divine Lamb, that she intercede for us with him, and present us to him in this life, until it be given us to possess him face to face in heaven. End quote. An interesting custom has traditionally been observed in the church on St. Agnes's feast day. Two lambs are brought from the Trappist Abbey of Trefontaine in Rome to the Pope to be blessed. 
On Holy Thursday they are shorn, and from the wool is woven the pallium, which the Pope gives to a newly consecrated Metropolitan Archbishop as a sign of his jurisdiction and his union with the Pope. St. Agnes is the patron saint of young girls, and the model and intercessor for the virtue of purity and, by extension, modesty and the custody of the eyes. Since these are her pet virtues, so to speak, today's feast is the perfect opportunity to take on the topic of purity with our children and within ourselves, gently but without blanching. It is the most assaulted and least taught virtue of our day. A tragedy, as Our Lady of Fatima warned us, that this sin of impurity casts more souls into hell than any other. And pertinent to the point are the practices of modesty and the custody of the eyes. Our Lady said specifically, quote, Certain fashions will be introduced that will offend our Lord very much. Pope Pius XII, speaking to a sodality convention in Rome, reiterated the Blessed Mother's warning and, and took it a step further. Quote, you live in a world which is constantly forgetful of God and the supernatural, where the only interest of the crowd seems to be the satisfaction of temporal needs, well-being, pleasure, and vanity. How many young girls there are who do not see any wrongdoing in following certain shameless styles like so many sheep. They certainly would blush if they could guess the impression they make and the feeling they evoke in those who see them. Do they not see the harm resulting from the excess in certain gymnastic exercises and sports not suitable for virtuous girls? What sins are committed or provoked by conversations which are too free, by immodest shows, by dangerous reading? How lax have consciences become? How pagan morals? End quote. And this was in 1954. How far we've fallen since then. I'm afraid it's true of most people. We've become so accustomed to living in a sewer, we don't smell it anymore. Immodesty and impurity permeate the very air we breathe. It's hard to avoid, but it can be done, and it must be. Society in general doesn't care about preserving our children's innocence or saving anyone's souls, so we have to make ourselves ever alert guardians as parents if we are parents, but also as custodians of our own souls, regardless of our stations in life. We lived in a terribly worldly city for a short while. The billboards were alarmingly evil, and sadly no worse than the people walking on the sidewalks. So what to do? We had the children bring books in the car. Eyes on your books, kids, was the auto motto in those days, and the children understood why. They didn't want sewage in their brains any more than we wanted them to have sewage in their brains. And we worded it just like that, because it's the truth. This kind of sin against purity is filth. Thank goodness immodest billboards aren't the problem in most places that they are in Las Vegas. But almost every town and city has places where practicing custody of the eyes does apply. If we were walking in a department store with our sons, for example, we'd warn them, eyes left if we were approaching the lingerie section up on the right. Soon enough, it became a habit for them. They have no business and should have no desire to stock their brains with images of women's underclothing. It's a given for most of us that most television programming is filled with immorality of all kinds, immodesty being just the tip of a very ugly iceberg, or maybe I should call it a landfill. Icebergs are too clean for this metaphor. Many Catholics get rid of their televisions completely, and this is great. Just make sure, if you have children, you teach them how to discriminate the good from the bad when they're out on their own some day. Don't throw them out there without stars to steer by. For those who keep their TVs, previewing entertainment serves two good purposes. One, you can discard anything unwholesome, of course, before it pollutes the minds and souls of your children. And two, you ipso facto set up the understanding in everyone's minds that programming isn't something that should be constantly running like a stream through their lives. Used in a healthier context, television and movies are things we carefully choose and enjoy as special events. Likewise, all internet sites, books, and periodicals should be carefully vetted, not just for our children, but for ourselves. We should never be so prideful or naive as to think that as adults we're immune to the influence of sewage being poured into our brains. 
There's nothing the devil likes better than this kind of a mindset. It's one of his favorite traps. And last but not least, the subject of modesty in ourselves is one near and dear to the heart of our little St. Agnes. Not only are we responsible for taking custody of our own eyes and what goes into them, but we're equally responsible for dressing and behaving in such a way that tempts no one around us to sin. It's a little ironic that during the recent global weirdness, one means of controlling the populace was to insist that everyone follow rules designed for the sake of others' well-being, even if they weren't concerned about their own. A great many zealously obeyed these restrictions, ostensibly for this reason, and most of us shake our heads and roll our eyes now at all of it, because we know most of the measures were foolish and have since been proven to have been fruitless. But what if the restrictions really did prevent the spiritual sickness and death of others? The modesty guidelines of the church do just that. They protect others' souls and by so doing help keep our own souls healthy as well. The church's advice regarding modest dress is not random or foolish, and the fruits of modesty are obvious. Does this mean women and girls need to wear potato sacks that reach to the floor, though? Of course not. The answer, I think, falls under a recommendation of St. John Bosco's that we love. Enjoy yourselves as much as you like, if you only keep from sin. Translate this to mean, for yourselves and the others around you, and in matters of the modern-day wardrobe, dress as hip or cool or whatever the word is these days, as or as fun as you like, just stay away from clothing that is tight or form-fitting and or see-through, that, that goes for both men and women, and that reveals anything between the base of your neck and below your knees. And open your minds, ladies, to the idea that slacks need not be the required daily uniform. Just consider it. There's a lot to be said for looking feminine in the face of the scourge of feminism. Here's a simple rule of thumb for the faithful. Ask yourself honestly, if our Lord, His Blessed Mother, or St. Agnes, suddenly appeared before me right now, would I instinctively want to pull my hem down or my collar up? Would I inch over to hide behind a door or a desk or something? If the answer is yes, go change for your own sake as well as for others. If the answer is no, you're probably good to go. You can find a link to the CMRI website on this topic in the show notes below. St. Agnes was born and raised in Rome, the most decadent city in the corrupt and evil Roman Empire, just before its complete collapse. She experienced many of the challenges we face today, trying to live a Catholic life in a wicked society, also on the verge of collapse, and pray to all the same core vices. Her intercession is particularly vital in our times. St. Agnes is the saint of purity and innocence, virtues that hold the highest of places in heaven but are exceedingly rare in our day. Very few even recognize purity and chastity as virtues, or care about virtue, period. Innocence is trampled underfoot. Our children are not only at risk, they're targeted by those who would destroy this most valued treasure. No effort is too much to recover the sense of wholesome goodness in our families that seems to have been discarded by our culture worldwide. We can never relax our guard in protecting our faith or in protecting innocence and purity. Today's patron, barely 13 years old, died rather than lose either. Pray for us, St. Agnes, to understand the value of purity, modesty, and custody of the eyes, to cultivate them in ourselves, and to have the courage to protect them at all costs. Blessed be God in His angels and in His saints.